Keep your Bibles open there to John chapter 17. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up. Preaching the second half of this morning's message about unity is the key. Taking our theme verse, the theme section there, and understanding what God says about this and about that all may know. And if you look at verse 21, leading up to our theme verse of verse 23, it says that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as, I, as thou hast loved me." Again, we see in this passage, as he's talking about that the world may know, God's preaching about something, God's praying to God. Isn't that an amazing thing? God praying to God. God the Son praying to God the Father. Just before going to the cross, this is the last, just a little bit before he'll be taken. And the key for that that the world may know is unity. Unity. Christ in us, us in Christ, the Father in Him, this idea of unity, of being one. As I mentioned this morning, it's not uniformity, it's unity. And as I looked at our church and prayed about our church, and again, we have a good church and good folks, you're wonderful folks, but I can tell, and you can tell looking around tonight, our church is lacking, in some aspects, in unity. Unity. We claim the same Savior, we've got the same book, but there's a unity that's lacking. And that all may know, and God here giving us a key to that, is unity. Unity, a oneness. So as we look at this passage and try to understand what God wants us to be, I believe Jesus wanted, of course, His disciples to be one. And that's what He was praying for. He said that they'd be one even as we are. So Jesus wants us to be one together, as well as with one with Him and one with the Father, as He is one with the Father. So it's hard for us to wrap our minds around, but that's the teaching God is trying to give us. That's why we have to think outside the flesh. That's why we have to think outside the box, if you will, this understanding of what it is, that God wants us to be one with Christ, one with one another, and one with the Father. This idea of unity and one. Now, we oppose that so often because we want our space. We oppose that because we want our privacy. We oppose that because sometimes we want to do our own thing. But God has given us this challenge that all may know, but it all hinges and begins with the key of unity. Being uni unified with Christ and unified with one another. So as we're looking at these keys on how we can have this unity, some of the focus on the unity, and because we are ought to be one, ought to have be unified, because as we saw this morning, we saw the means, the power, if you will, the means of unity we saw this morning, morning is a shared glory. A shared glory. That's why it says, and the glory, Jesus talking to the Father, and the glory which thou gavest me. Aren't you glad God glorified Jesus Christ? He prayed that several times about being glorified in Him, glorifying the Father. They're in the business of glorifying one another. The glory of God. And we think about the Shekinah glory we preached about just a few weeks ago about there in Solomon's temple and, and how the power of God came and the presence of God came in His glory. And so he says there, and all the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. He said, the glory you've given me, I've given them. So we have, God has given us. He said he already has given. It's not something we'll have just in heaven. But something we can have now, the glory of God. And we talked what that did not mean, but also we saw this morning that we can get, have the shared glory of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's not just me, it's us. So the glory of Jesus shared with us, and us sharing, we're unified by the glory of Jesus Christ. And as I mentioned this morning, there ought to be something about our life that has the glory of God on it. There ought to be something about our spirit that has the glory of God in it. So we have to think about, is there anything in our life that manifests and shows the glory? And we saw the unity of the shared glory came by salvation. 
the glory of the grace of God. As he saved us, that brings us the glory of God. And we saw the glory is also shared by the Spirit and by the Scriptures and by sanctification. And then we went on and saw the movement of unity is a shared mission. God has given a mission to us. He said, as you have sent me, I have sent them. We're on a mission. You say, well, preacher, I don't know what to do. God has given us a mission. And that mission is that all may know. It's, aren't you glad salvation in the gospel isn't just for a little group of people called Americans, called Baptists. It's for all the world. And so Jesus was sent in the world to save sinners. And so as you've sent me, he said, so have I sent them. So that we have this unity of a mission. Well, we're on the same mission. We may have different likes. One may like Mountain Dew. One may like Diet Coke. One may like Diet Snapple. There's the spiritual people. All right? Diet Peach Snapple. That's the best. You can tell your spirituality, but how much you like. No. But we've got the same mission. That ought to unify us. You say, well, I don't like the way they look and I look different than them. But yes, but we've got the same mission with that we're on. The same purpose. That ought to unify us. See, that's why we come on Sunday morning, on Sunday night, and on Wednesday night and go out soul winning. And that's why we carry gospel tracts. Because we've got the same mission. That all may know. That unifies us. Do you understand what I mean by that? It unifies us. You look at the ball players and uh, the football players and baseball players. They should be unified with the mission of winning games. They may not get along together always outside. They may have different ideas. But boy, when they hit the field, they say, we've got a mission to go on. And so they travel together. They spend time together. They work together. And they labor together because they've got the same mission. So we saw the movement of unity. If we're unified, we have that same shared mission. You know, tonight we're looking at the last two keys of this idea of unity. We see next that the manners of unity is a shared presence. The manners of unity is a shared presence. And that shared presence is Christ in us. Again, verse 21. That they may know that they may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee that they also may be one in us. Verse 23, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. We're talking about a shared presence of Christ in us. Us in Him, and Him in us. By manner, I mean our attitudes. By manner, I mean our actions. By manner, I'm talking about our spirit and our conduct. Uh, just how we are and who we are in the world and how we respond and where we go. Our manner is about us. You look at somebody and say, well, I recognize their manner, how they are, how they behave, how they work with people, how they conduct themselves, how they present themselves, this idea of manner. Now, our manner, our lifestyle, we'll all be different, but there ought to be certain manners about us that ought to be unified and the same because we have the same Savior inside. We have His presence in us, and we're in Him. That ought to produce in us a unifying manner, our spirit, our attitude, regardless of how we think, regardless of how we live, regardless of what we may look like. Let me just read you a couple of quotes from Charles Spurgeon about this idea. I would try to tell too, but it's best I just read it because he did such a good exposition of it. There's going to be certain things about you that are the same about me, that are the same about every Christian, because Christ lives in us. That ought to bring a unity in our manners about us. I and them. We just read that in the Scriptures in verse 23. I and them. Christ lives in His people, and we are to act like that. So that onlookers shall say, Surely Christ lives again in that man. For he acts out the precepts of Jesus. That's the manner of somebody who has Christ in them. That they would look at our life, not for our glory, but for his, and say, surely I like that Christ lives again in that man. Can we say that? That is the manner to have unity. And if we have that, they'll be unified. He goes on, he puts it another way. 
He said, suppose I were to find a man living in the likeness of Christ with his spiritual glory conspicuous upon him. It may be that he would be poor and illiterate, but what of that? Suppose he is a coal miner. The glory of his character will be nonetheless conspicuous amid the dust. Then let us find another man on whom the same spiritual glory rests, and we will suppose him to be an earl. A supposition which, thank God, is not impossible. The glory will be just as bright in spite of the good man's honors. There then are the two, a coal miner and a coronated earl. Does it need half an eye to see that the glory of each is one? That's why when you can walk into a church, you may have the coal miner, you may have the guy who walks behind the garbage truck and puts the garbage in, you may have the one who's a CEO, you may have the wealthy, you may have the poor, you may have folks that live in their car and folks that live in Black Hawk, but their manners will be the same. The glory of God will still manifest in their life. One may be illiterate in his communication, he may talk rough, he may talk coarse, he may have a vocabulary of a fourth grader, or he may be an intellectual, he may have a PhD in English lit, but regardless, they're going to have some of the same manners. Why? They're unified in the church. You say, well, how in the world can a rich person get along with a poor person? How can the mannerisms of a rich person and the manner of a poor person be the same? Because we have the same Christ in us. Our attitude and our spirit and our actions and our conduct will be much the same. We'll be unified because we have the presence of Jesus Christ. We look at the disciples. You've got the doctors, Luke. You've got the fishermen. You've got the tax collectors. You've got all kinds, but they were unified in their manners. Though they were different in their speech, they were different in their approach. They were unified in their manner, in their attitude, in their spirit because Christ was with them and they were living for him. So how's our manners tonight? The manners of unity, what unites us, is a shared presence, the presence of Jesus Christ. I think I put it in your notes. Our presence in the world, in other words, our attitude in the world, our impact in the world, our response to the world, when you walk in, you, by the way, you have a presence. You have some kind of presence in the workplace and in your family. When daddy walks in, when mama walks in, when you've got your name there and you walk in, you're bringing a presence with you. That impact, that air, that presence, that Spirit of God in you is going to have an impact. Our presence in the world is dependent upon His presence in us. The idea that because Christ lives in me, I have an effect in the world. Yeah, so this idea, the manners of unity, what's going to keep us together, what holds us together, our manners as a Christian, then is because of a shared presence. Same presence in you as in me. Now, Jesus describes his desire for our presence and us in looking at verse number 21. First of all, our present, his present presence. He was talking about them. That's a spiritual presence. Verse 21. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Verse 23. I am in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. There we have a spiritual presence. That's right now. If you're saved, you have a spiritual presence of God, of Christ, inside of us. Do you understand that? That Christ is in us right now in a spiritual sense. It's not something in the future. It's not so, Right now, He dwells in us. That's so critical we understand it if we're going to let the all that all may know that we can have the right manners, the right spirit, the right attitude. Again, this unification because of a shared presence. That's His present promise, His present presence with us, His spiritual present in us. In us, in us, and us in Him. But then he also in this passage talks about a future presence. A physical presence. Look at verse 24. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that thou may behold my glory which thou hast given me. So he says, not only do I want them in me and me in them, but I'm going to want them with me 
where I am. Now he's getting ready to go back to heaven. He knows that. He knows he's soon going to cross. And so he's got a future presence he's looking at. And that's a physical presence with us. Oh, won't that be a glorious day? As we here in this life, we've got His presence in us, but there's coming a day where we'll have a presence with Him. Yes, oh, that we'll see Him face to face. We'll be able to put our hands in the holes in His hands and a hand in the side. We will see Him face to face, and as we sing about it, that our faith will become sight. So I'm glad God desires His presence in us and with us. Oh, both aspects are glorious. Both aspects should affect our manner in this world. Because as we go to work tomorrow, as we spend time with our family, as we deal with issues, not only do we have the unity of the fact that Christ is in us, but also we're going to have, a, we get the fact that we will be with Him and Him with us in heaven. Boy, I'm glad we've got that to look forward to. What a joy. So we're looking at the presence of God. It's a shared presence. That brings a manner to us. Again, our communication, it's unity, not uniformity. Well, God has made us different. God uses us in different ways. We talk about the folks up at the rest home. That takes some special people to do that. You may be one of those, but there's a uniqueness about that. There's other folks that want it. I said it so often. When you go out and deal with folks about the gospel, sometimes it takes one kind of person to talk to the Hell's Angels crowd and another talks to that 90-year-old Presbyterian lady. Okay, You're going to have a little different approach. Same gospel, but a little different approach when you go. So the manners of unity is, by, is, is a shared presence. Very quickly, let's look at this presence. Five keys for unity based on His presence in us. And we're going to be turning to a few scriptures, so get your fingers ready and stay awake. Five keys to unity based upon His presence in us. Turn over, first of all, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Go ahead and look there. Find that in your Bible. Get ready to go. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to learn about His presence in us. And because His presence in us, it's going to to bring unity to our church and unity to our mission. His presence in us. First of all, His presence in us is a puzzle. It's a puzzle. See, we don't get excited about it too much because we don't understand it. I can't, we can't figure out what does that mean? How can Christ who is God, who's God in the flesh, who died 2,000 years ago, buried and rose again, how can He live in me? It's a puzzle. Colossians 1 and in verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. God says it's a mystery. It's a puzzle. It's from generations. Have been, the Old Testament, they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't, it's been a mystery of how this was going to work. It was going to be a mystery of how God had this plan. It was a mystery in the Old Testament. Look what it says again. Verse 26, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations. I'm so glad I'm living on this side of the completed scripture. Oh, we can look and say, well, I can understand it. They did not know. They did not have the completed scripture in hand. They were still pinning it down. They were still looking ahead, trying to figure out. We look back and we can see it. Even the mystery, which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known which is the riches of his glory of this mystery, which is among the Gentiles. And what is the mystery? Christ in you. See, in the Old Testament... The Trinity, by the way, the Trinity is still in the Old Testament. The Trinity came and went. So what are you talking about? God the Father. God the Father, God Jehovah, His presence came and went. Remember in the temple, in the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory, it would come and it would go. There'd be times it would be there. There'd be times when people sinned. It would go. The Shekinah glory of God, God the Father, His presence, if you will, that manifestation of His presence would come and it would go. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament came upon people and would go. He would come upon for a certain reason, a certain season, and He would leave. Not that they lost their salvation. It's just the Holy Spirit would come and go. So God the Father would come and go. The Shekinah glory, the cloud, 
The pillar of fire, His presence would come and go. The Holy Spirit, He would come and go. The pre-incarnate Christ, as in the case of Jacob, wrestling with Him all night, in the case of Joshua, seeing there as the, as, as, as the uh, captain of the army, the pre-incarnate Christ, before He took on permanent flesh, which He still has, glorified permanent flesh, He got it, yeah, but back then He would come, and he would go. He would show up. He would do business. And he would leave. So we've got the Father would come and go. The Holy Spirit would come on people and leave. And the pre-incarnate Christ would show up and leave. But now, there's a mystery. But now, aren't you glad it's a but now? But now, Jesus Christ, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He dwells in us. The mystery that they could not understand, the puzzle still for us trying to scratch our head, what does it mean, is the fact that Christ in us. I'm glad. You say, preacher, I don't understand it. You don't have to understand it. We just have to believe it and have to live it and let Christ have his way in our lives. And you'll be surprised how much more you'll understand it when you just accept it. Amen. And you start living it. So, but now, it's, the mystery's been solved. Scratch that, it's been revealed. I like what he says there. Verse 27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. He's made it known to his saints. He's made us known to us. Wow. We think about, we've got the puzzle figured out. That brings Unity. His presence is a puzzle and a mystery. That's You talk to the world. You talk to people who are not saved and try to talk about Jesus inside you. They don't know what you're talking about. They have no clue what that means. But for those that are saved, His presence is a puzzle that's been revealed to us. That brings unity because we have the presence revealed in us. Secondly, His presence is a prize. His presence is a prize, or a precious prize. Still say in Colossians 1, 26. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest unto his saints. He's revealed it to us. That unifies us. It brings a manner to us because we know he dwells in us. To whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We've got a present Pre very precious prize in the fact that Christ is in us. That's a precious prize. That's a precious thing. Notice what it says. To whom, verse 27, God will make no... Read your Bible. Read your Bible slowly. Read your Bible and think about what God is saying. God doesn't just put out words to fill a book. But notice what it says. To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. This mystery of Christ in you, this mystery of Christ in me, is the riches of glory. You say, how good and how rich is the glory of God's glory? It's Christ in us. Don't, don't minimize Christ in us. Don't minimize the fact that Jesus Christ lives in here. Don't minimize that fact that Christ lives in you. Don't minimize the Christ fact that each of us that are saved has Christ living inside of us that unifies us. That is the riches of His glory. Oh, we think we, we, we look over here and we want riches on heaven and we want the streets of gold. Oh, the greatest riches are Christ in us. The mystery of Christ in us. It's the riches of glory. And then he goes on and says it is the hope of glory. The riches of glory and the hope, the anticipation of glory. See, he dwells in me now. We saw that. His present spiritual state, his presence is in me spiritually, but he's looking for that hope of glory, the anticipation of glory, when we're with him in heaven. Well, that ought to unify us. We've got the same precious prize. We've got the same riches of glory. Oh, we're in the... You've joined the rich man's club. <laughs> the riches of glory. He said, well, I can't belong to the, to the country club. Oh, we got a better club, amen. amen. The riches of glory and the hope of glory, the Christ in us. That ought to unify us. So, where are you going tonight? Going to church. Why? Because I'm going to some other folks that have the riches of glory and the hope of glory and the mystery solved, mystery revealed, Christ in us. Maybe not in somebody else who doesn't know him, but in us it is. That ought to unify us. So we find his presence is a precious prize. His presence is a puzzle. Very quickly, his presence in us that unifies us is a provision for fullness. A provision for fullness. Look at our, look at our text, verse 23. Back in our text, John chapter 17, verse 23. John 17, 23. I in them, and thou in me, 
that they may be made perfect in one. Perfect in one. We know the word perfect means complete. The word perfect means full. It means nothing lacking, all in place. Turn to Ephesians very quickly. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm sorry to make you turn to some verses, but it helps you stay awake after a long afternoon. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. There he is. He's in our hearts. People say, well, Jesus doesn't live in you. It says he dwells in my heart. It, Jesus said that I'm in them. So he does get in there. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints. By the way, we're supposed to understand this. Comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye may be filled with all the fullness of of God. So we are to be filled the fact that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. We are supposed to understand that love of Christ that we may be filled with all the fullness of God and then in our text verse that we be perfect in one. God has made provision by His presence for us to experience fullness. Do you understand what it means? To be full? Are you out there tonight? Think of it as the hometown buffet of spirituality. You pay, I, it's been a while since I've been to the hometown buffet, but you pay your 25 bucks, and so you want to make sure you eat $75 worth. <laughs> you know, I'm going to get my money's worth. You got your money's worth when you first just walked past and took a smell, that's right. But boy, I'm going to get my money's worth. And you're going to eat, and you're going to time it, and you're going to get full. You're going to pause for a second. You're going to walk around a little bit of a second. You're going to go, I think i got a little room for some ice cream over here. And boy, I'm going to... You eat to the full. And you walk out of the community saying, oh, I can't believe I ate all that. Boy, I am so full. Morning comes and you were hungry for breakfast again. But in the meantime, you are full. So look at it this way. The fullness of God. God, His presence in us, is a provision for fullness. So, you say, well, I feel empty. You should not feel empty. We should not feel empty. God has made provision by Christ in us that we have the fullness of God. You say, I feel an emptiness inside. I feel a spiritual lacking inside. Then we're missing it. God says we're supposed to comprehend the love that passes knowledge. The passes of knowledge. The fullness of God. Why? Because Christ in us. We in Christ. Christ in Him. And that mystery revealed as we saw there in Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 3 that we have this that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith, that we might be filled with the fullness of God. Think about what the fullness of God must mean. It must mean joy. It must mean peace. It must mean power. It must mean a comprehension. It must mean a compassion. It must mean a very presence of God. There's going to be something about us. See, the problem is we don't live in that knowledge. We don't live with that provision that God has provided for us fullness. So we've got a bunch of folks and we gather together. Why? Because we've got the same precious prize. The riches of glory and the hope of glory. We've got the same provision of fullness of God in our lives. It'll bring unity to us and give us direction, give us a desire that all may know because they can have that. See, the gospel and the power of God, the presence of God, is not diminished one little bit by you giving it away. In fact, it fills you more. The more you give it, the more you're filled with it. The love of Christ in you and the power of God in you, the joy of the Spirit, and it may know, the more you give, the more you've got. But the less you give, the less you sense it, the less you feel it. Here we are. His presence is a puzzle. Well, we know the answer. We know the mystery. We've got the precious prize, the riches of glory, the hope of glory. We've got the provision for fullness of God. And it's just because of His presence in us. That is what He says, that, that, that all may know, that the world may know. He says, why? Because of unity. Because of the presence of God in us. Very quickly. Number next. His presence is a provision for the fullness, but also His presence in us is a power. 
is a power. I think I've got it in your notes. 1 John 4.4 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Wow. We've seen the Christ in us and us in Christ. It's, it's the provision for fullness. It's, it's the prize. It's, it's, it's those things. But it's also a power. Christ in us. Overcomers. Not undercomers. Not undertakers. Overcomers. Yeah. Let me remind you. There's nothing to overcome if you don't have a problem. There's nothing to overcome if there's not a struggle. There's nothing to overcome if there's not a battle. So we expect the battles, we expect the issues, we expect those things, but we are overcomers because of His presence in us. It's a power. Because He's overcome. Greater is He that is you than He is in the world. Don't, don't, let the power, don't let the world defeat you. All they can do is kill your body. Jesus says we, don't have to, we shouldn't fear those that can only kill the body. We should fear the one who can destroy our soul in hell. That's God. Only God. I'm glad he's overcome. That ought to unify us. The fact that we all have the power. We are all overcomers. We're all on the winning side. Why in the world we hang around with the losing side when we're on the winning side? It brings that unity to us that all may know. We want others to know that power. We look at folks that have issues with alcohol and with drugs and with, with just the wickedness of the world. They need to have that power to overcome. And that power is available to them too. That all may know. That all may know. The presence, His presence in us is a power. Very quickly, His presence in us is a purifier is a purifier. That ought to bring unity to us also. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6. Verse number 15. We're talking about His presence in us. By the way, that's not just a small doctrine. That's a Bible doctrine throughout the Scriptures. And we find here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? So I'm a member of Christ. Both I make up His body and He's in me. And so I'm a member of Christ and Christ is in me. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. He says, can't you understand, talking to the church at Corinth, it was all so carnal and had such wickedness going on. He says, can't you understand that with Christ in you and you being a member of Christ and part of Christ's body and Christ being in you, he says, you can't take yourself into a harlot. That would be wicked. That would be vile because you're taking Christ there. Verse 16, what? Know ye not that which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith he shall, he, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, which is yours, and you in your spirit, which are God's. There's a purifying understanding that his presence purifies us. How in the world, if I can remember that, and that He dwells inside of me, as He dwells inside of me, I do not want to take Christ into the, to the depths of sin. I do not want to take Christ into the wickedness of the world. I do not want to do... It purifies us when we realize that. And that brings unity to us because there's a purity that His presence brings to us. We see the manners of unity is a shared presence. All that will bring such unity to us. To help us have that stirring to, that all may know. Very quickly we'll be done. The motive for unity is a shared love. The motive for unity is a shared love. The love of God in us. Look back at our text. 
John chapter 17, verse 23. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Verse 26. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Notice we're talking about in verse 26, the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. The love of God in them. In them. And in verse 23, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. I have to ask myself, is the love of God in me? Is it flowing in me? Is it growing in me? Is it seen in me? Very quickly, the love of God in us, not for us, just, not just for us, but in us, the love of God in us is a unique love. It's a unique love. That means it's a love we receive and enjoy. A love we receive and enjoy. Verse 23. You see, we, get, we, we even push against this because we cannot fathom it. The latter part of verse 23. And if the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Listen to what Jesus is saying. Talking to the Father, he said, I want the world to know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. In other words, the love of God to Christ is the same as God's love to us. Look at what he says. Look what he says. As Jesus is praying, and as thou hast loved them, Say, God, you've loved them. I want them to know that you've loved them as thou hast loved me. If that doesn't put your Christian life in a new perspective. Yes, God loved Christ. And he puts up with me. Oh. He loves us. That's the love. It's a unique love that we receive and enjoy. When we understand that He loves us in the same manner that He loved Christ, that ought to give confidence to us in our prayer life, in our walk, in our unity, in our service, in our desire to that all may know. But not only is the love of God in us a unique love, meaning we receive it and enjoy it, but the love of God in us is a unifying love. A unifying love means it's a love we give and apply. Stay with me. We're almost done. It's a love we give and apply. Verse 26. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it. Why? That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. The love that God, notice what it says, the love with which thou hast loved me, Jesus said, the love that you have loved me will be in them. In other words, it's the love that comes out. The love of God in us is the part that we enjoy. It's unique. We enjoy. We receive it. But then there's also the love of God in us that goes out. And we apply. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. The unity of loving. The love of God in us ought to bring unity. It's the same one. Loving one another. It's the loving of all men. That means that love that we give is sacrificial. It's the love of God, which means it's sacrificial. It's not selfish. We find when we're selfish, we're not manifesting the love of God. Because the love of God is not selfish. It's sacrificial. It's unrequited. It's unrequited. It means it doesn't have to come back. God loves us 
before we loved Him. We love Him because He first loved us. There on the cross as He showed His love, He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Aren't you glad He loved you before you, he, before you even knew Him? Yeah. It's unrequited. God loves us even though we don't love Him. Even though we do not respond that love back. Well, I love that person, but they don't love me. That's not the love of God. The love of God is unrequited. It's unquenchable. It's unquenching. God didn't say, I don't love you anymore because you did that. Just write it down. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. That's the love of God. So tonight, as we looked at all may know, what's the key that Lighthouse Baptist Church, what's the key that you and I laboring together so that all may know it's unity? You can go knock a bunch of doors, but not many people are going to know. But all may know is that we have unity. And when they come in and sense the unity here, as Christ was praying, we got the means for unity. That's the shared glory. The glory God gave Christ, He gives to us. The movement of unity is the shared mission. And we've got something to do. As God sent the Father, as the Father sent the Son, so He sent us. And we do have the manners of unity, and that's the shared presence. And we have the motive, and that's the shared love. That all may know. How are we going to be that all may know? We may be one. With the Father, with the Son, with one another. Let's bow our heads, please.